Module 4, The Leadership of Susan B. Anthony, Reading the Hope Chest by Karen Schwabach, Chapter 9. Homework. Read Chapter 9, then complete the summary notes and summary. Background Information for Chapter 9. Palmer Agents. Government agents who later became the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI. These agents investigated and arrested people who were considered traitors for speaking against World War I and the U.S. government. Florence Kelly worked to stop child labor, get women the right to vote, and protect the civil rights of African Americans. She was a founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP. The NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, was formed in 1909 to help protect the rights of all people and end racial discrimination or treating others unfairly. Chapter 9, Mr. Martin's Escape. Chapter 9, Mr. Martin's Escape, page 98. The train climbed steeply up into what Miss Dexter said, when she started speaking again, were the Blue Ridge Mountains. But darkness had fallen, and the only thing Violet could see out the window was the reflection on the inside of the train car, two long rows of passengers, mostly women, on red mohair-covered seats, surrounded by their handbags, hat boxes, picnic baskets, valises, and traveling pillows. I hope you understand. I'm not a racialist, Violet, Miss Dexter was saying as she unpacked fried chicken, biscuits, and apples from the picnic basket. Mr. Martin doesn't seem to understand this. He doesn't seem to realize that with everything we women have worked so hard for in the balance, we can't be distracted by every little battle that comes our way. Page 99 Mr. Martin had gone to look for something for them to drink. Can I take some of this to Myrtle? Violet asked, indicating the meal Miss Dexter was serving out. A few days ago, she would have considered it the very height of bad breeding to ask her hostess for more food. But she was starting to realize that being brought up well had its disadvantages. It kept you from asking for the things you needed. Yes, of course, said Miss Dexter. I certainly don't intend to starve the child she added, wrapping up some food in a napkin. Separation of the races doesn't necessarily mean inequality, Violet. It just... In honor of her newfound rudeness, Violet walked away without waiting to hear the end of this. Violet worked her way around toward the back of the train. There was no point in asking directions, she thought, on a train. She found the colored car all the way at the back. Clutching the napkin in her fist, she opened the last door and walked back through the aisle of colored passengers. She found Myrtle sitting next to an elderly woman. I brought you some dinner, said Violet. She held out the napkin. Thanks, said Myrtle. Mrs. Merganzer, this is my friend Violet. Mrs. Merganzer looked at Violet and nodded a greeting. Then she closed her eyes and seemed to fall asleep. Violet supposed she must be too old to stay awake. Turn the page. Page 100. Can I sit down, she asked. She felt uncomfortable being the only white person in the colored car, but she was tired of Miss Dexter and in no hurry to get back to her. And there was something she wanted to ask Myrtle about anyway. Sure. Myrtle made a space between herself and the window, and Violet squeezed into it. The rattan seats in the colored car were even more uncomfortable than the mohair-covered iron springs. Why didn't they make train seats out of something more comfortable? I think Mr. Martin might be on the run from the police, she said to Myrtle. Did you only just now figure that out, said Myrtle? Well, when did you figure it out, Violet asked, annoyed. First time I saw him, back in New York, when he jumped a mile when we came into the room. Violet wasn't sure if Myrtle was telling the truth, or was just trying to show how smart she was. Anyway, Violet had more pressing concerns. But don't you think he might be a little bit smitten with my sister? Yes, Myrtle frowned. They sat in silence for a moment. 
Doesn't your sister know how to send a fella to the right about if he gets too fresh? I guess so, said Violet. One way or another, Chloe had certainly sent the Mr. R's to the right about. Then I wouldn't worry about it, said Myrtle. Page 101. But what about him being on the run from the police, we think? Myrtle did that shrug thing with her eyes. Apparently, she didn't consider being on the run from the police a major character flaw. Well, he could be dangerous, said Violet. He could hurt us. He hasn't hurt us yet, has he, said Myrtle. Violet must have conveyed by her expression that this wasn't a satisfactory answer, because Myrtle added, there are lots of ways to get in trouble with the law without hurting anybody, you know. Violet did not know this. Anyway, I think maybe she has already sent him to the right about, and now he wants to try to get her to change her mind. Myrtle nodded. She must have come to the same conclusion. Maybe she'll want to change her mind. I don't think so, said Violet. She doesn't want a gentleman friend. She sent these fellows back home in Susquehanna to the right about, and they were much better looking than Mr. Martin. Looks are in everything, said Myrtle, sagely. Violet was starting to get a prickly, uncomfortable feeling in the back of her neck. She turned around quickly. From the studied way that everyone was looking somewhere else, she was sure they'd all been staring at her a second ago. Am I not supposed to be in here? said Violet. Turn the page. Page 102. I don't know, said Myrtle. Probably not. Violet got up. Being out of place was unpleasant. It made her stomach hurt. She might as well go back and get her own dinner. I'll see you later, she said. She turned to say goodbye to Mrs. Merganser, but the old woman was sound asleep. She must be too old to even talk anyway, Violet thought. Just as she got back to the suffragist's car, the door at the other end of it snapped open, and two men strode in. The men were dressed in black suits with starched collars that seemed to hold their chins up uncomfortably high. They marched down the car and stopped in the aisle next to Miss Dexter. "'Excuse me, ma'am,' said one of the men. "'Is there a man occupying the seat?' He pointed to the place Mr. Martin had just vacated. "'Yes,' said Miss Dexter, looking surprised. "'He's just gone to get drinks.' "'Aha,' said the man who had spoken, and the two men looked at each other and nodded. Then they just stood there. As Violet came up to them, she could see this made Miss Dexter nervous. They made Violet nervous, too. They had an official, police-like air about them. "'May I ask who you are?' Miss Dexter asked. "'I'm sorry, ma'am. We're not at liberty to say,' said the man who had spoken first. Then the train lurched around a bend, and both men fell, sprawling down the aisle, their arms and legs tangled together. Page 103. They picked themselves up with great dignity, as if they had meant to fall down. They made their way back up the aisle to Miss Dexter, gripping the edges of the seats tightly. Violet didn't know who these men were, but she and Myrtle both thought Mr. Martin was running from the police. Mother and father would probably have thought Mr. Martin was beyond the pale, but Myrtle liked him. Maybe he hadn't even really done whatever it was the police were after him for. Maybe there'd been some kind of mistake. Violet made up her mind. Even if there hadn't been a mistake, she wasn't going to let the police catch Mr. Ma Martin. She liked him. He talked to her like she was a person, and he'd stuck up for Myrtle, too. Whatever else he might have done, well, she just hoped it wasn't anything too horrible. Violet tried to slip past the two men headed the way Mr. Martin had gone to look for drinks. One of the men stepped in front of her, blocking her way. I'm just going to use the saloon, Violet said, with the most innocent look she could muster. The bathrooms on trains were called saloons, for no reason Violet could imagine. The man stepped aside and let Violet pass. Violet tried to walk calmly to the end of the train, gripping the backs of the seats as the train's movement threw her from one side of the aisle to the other. She opened the door with difficulty and walked nervously through the narrow... Turn the page. Page 104. She opened the door with difficulty and walked nervously through the narrow vestibule. The four doors at its front, back, and sides rattled loudly. She opened the door to the next car 
and managed to squeeze through it before it slammed on her. A conductor stepped in front of her. Not the conductor from Washington, but a different one. Whoa there, Missy, he said. You don't need to be running around between train cars like that. It's dangerous. Where's your seat? There, said Violet, nodding to the car ahead. One thing her eleven years of life had taught her was that the mo most males considered women and girls to be simultaneously mysterious and not very bright, so it wasn't very hard to lie to them. The conductor looked over his shoulder. Well then, how did you manage? Excuse me, said Violet, and pushed past him. She found Mr. Martin in a vestibule after she'd passed through four more cars. He came out one door as she was coming out the other. He had a brown bottle of root beer in each hand and one sticking out of each of his trouser pockets. Mr. Martin, stop, she said, holding up a hand toward him. She was out of breath from the effort of walking in the rocking train and pushing through the heavy doors. Mr. Martin stopped and stood looking down at her quizzically. The train was chugging slowly up a steep grade. The jointed floor of the vestibule heaved and creaked under their feet, and they both braced their legs to keep from falling. Page 105. There are some men back there, Violet said, looking for you. They're wearing tight collars, and they won't say their names. Mr. Martin looked surprised at none of this. Palmer agents. Did they ask for me by name? Violet had to think for a moment. No. Mr. Martin, Martin nodded. Good. Don't tell them my name, please. He put the two bottles of root beer into Violet's hands. Forgive my abruptness, Miss Mayhew, but I'm going to get off the train here. To what? said Violet, not sure she'd heard him right. The train had reached the crest of the hill. You can tell them where I got off, said Mr. Martin. In fact, you'd better. Give my apologies to the ladies. He opened one of the side doors of the vestibule and stepped out. Mr. Martin, Violet gasped. The side doors were for getting off the train, but getting off after it had stopped, of course. Violet didn't hear him hit the ground because the train was making so much noise. It was true it wasn't moving very fast, but she couldn't see what, she, what he'd stepped off into either, and neither, she thought, could he. There might have been a 300-foot cliff beside the tracks for all either of them knew. She dropped the root beer bottles. One of them turned the page. Page 106. She dropped the root beer bottles. One of them shattered and grabbed the handrail beside the still swinging door. She leaned out as far as she dared. She felt a warm wind on her face and smelled pine trees and coal smoke. Mr. Martin, she cried. The train crested the mountain and started downward again, picking up speed. Violet heard a door behind her open. A heavy hand landed on her shoulder and hauled her back into the vestibule. The two men, Palmer agents, whatever those were, glared down at Violet. The one who had grabbed her barked, What do you think you're doing, miss? Where's our pappy? snapped the second one. Violet angrily jerked her shoulder free of the man's hand. Who? Our Padfee, where'd he go? Did he jump? I don't know what you're talking about, said Violet. Listen, miss, we are looking for Sandor our Padfee. Scar on his face, one eye, missing three fingers on his right hand. Sound like anybody you know? Three fingers, said Violet, plain dumb. She watched the remaining root beer bottle rolling around on the floor. We're not going to get anywhere with this one, said the second agent. She warned him, said the first agent, pointing at Violet. He gripped Violet's arm hard. It hurt. Where is our Padfee girl? Don't play games with us. This is a criminal investigation of the highest order. Page 107. Treason, the other agent said succinctly. Violet felt a twist in her stomach. Treason, she'd always heard, was worse than murder. But why should she believe these two idiots? She could make her own decisions about people. Mr. Martin didn't seem like a traitor to her. She glared at the agents and said nothing. He must have jumped. The agent who had a hold of Violet's arm nodded at the side door, which was still swinging, opening a few inches and then gently slamming itself shut again. I'm going after him. The agent let go of Violet and kicked the door wide open. 
Violet could see the light shining out of the train's many windows, flickering over the ground, moving by below. The agent turned to the other agent. Question the subs. See if you can get any of them to understand what accessory after the fact means. Then get off in Roanoke and cable J. Edgar Hoover that we spotted our pad fee. He stepped out through the door. No! Violet cried, horrified, as he jumped. The train was by no means moving as slowly as it had been when Mr. Martin jumped off. Come on, miss, said the other agent, grabbing her arm. Let's see what you and the suffs can manage to babble out. You know, I don't believe he ever told us his name, Miss Dexter said loudly. Violet was surprised at how well she pretended to be stupid, and surprised she was... Turn the page. Page 108. Violet was surprised at how well she pretended to be stupid, and surprised she was willing to do it for Mr. Martin, whom Miss Dexter clearly disliked. He joined us at Union Station and begged a spare seat in our car, but he's a complete stranger to me. The agent, who had finally admitted that his name was Mr. Christopher, had sat down in Mr. Martin's empty seat and unfolded a paper on his lap, a rough pencil sketch that could have been Mr. Martin in the same vague way that pictures of Uncle Sam could have been Violet's grandfather, grandfather Mayhew. It did have a scar on it. Many of the other suffragists had gotten up and crowded around, clinging to the backs of seats for balance. Miss Dexter, Mr. Christopher said, try to get this through, that female wool you call a brain. The suffragist hissed. This man is dangerous. He poses a threat to the United States of America. By helping to conceal him, you could be guilty of treason. What's he supposed to have done? demanded a gray-haired suffragist in a purple dress. I can't tell you that said Mr. Christopher. The woman in purple snorted. Mr. Christopher asked a number of questions about whether anyone had heard Sandor or Ar Padfi mention where he'd been or where he was going or any names of friends or relatives or associates. Nobody offered him much help. Did he say anything that sounded Bolshevik? Mr. Christopher finally demanded. You know anything un-American? Page 109. Miss Dexter shrugged delicately. I suppose some of the things he said were a bit socialist, she said, but there's an enormous difference between a Bolshevik and a socialist. That's what the socialists would like you to think, said Mr. Christopher. Socialists are good Americans, said the woman in purple angrily. They believe in cooperation instead of competition. Many of the greatest and wisest people in our country are socialists. Mr. Christopher sneered. That's why women shouldn't be allowed to vote, he said. The female mind isn't capable of making fine distinctions of logic. The woman turned as purple as her dress. Miss Helen Keller is a socialist, she stormed. Miss Lillian Wald, a socialist. Miss Jane Adams is a socialist. Miss, if they kept their addled brains out of politics, maybe someone would marry them, Mr. Christopher said nastily. He got to his feet. The train was slowing as if approaching the station, but Violet thought that wasn't the only reason he was leaving. The crowd was closing in on him. Mr. Christopher took his pencil sketch and his notebook and retreated. What a horrid man, Miss Dexter said. The other suffragists agreed heartily. They made their way back to their seats, and Violet could hear them talking speculating, she supposed, about Mr. Martin and what he'd done to get those dreadful government agents chasing him. Violet's stomach squirmed. She hoped the... Turn the page. Page 110. She hoped the ground hadn't been too far away when Mr. Martin had hit it. Where had he landed, and what would he do now? Violet looked over at the woman in purple. There was an empty seat next to her. Violet got up, and jostled over and sat down in it. Excuse me, Miss Kelly, said the woman, sticking out her hand and smiling. Fortunately, Miss Kelly didn't seem to know that children should speak only when spoken to. Florence Kelly, pleased to meet you. Violet shook hands and introduced herself. What are Palmer agents, Miss Kelly? Miss Kelly frowned. Is that who those clowns were? I thought that might be it. Mr. Palmer is the U.S. Attorney General. 
and he's got a crazy assistant named J. Edgar Hoover. Miss Kelly rolled her eyes at the ridiculous name. Their agents track down radicals and arrest them. Arrest them for what? said Violet. Mostly for being against the war, said Miss Kelly. But the war is over, said, Mi said Violet. Parts of it are, Miss Kelly said. And what are Bolshevists? Violet asked. She had some idea, but she wanted to hear what Miss Kelly would say, especially since Miss Kelly was clearly one of those rare adults, like Chloe and Mr. Martin, who talked about things that mattered and let you ask questions. The Bolsheviks are the people who overthrew the Tsar in Russia, said Miss Kelly, but people just use the word to mean anybody that wants to change the way things are, to make us sound dangerous. Some people say we suffragists are Bolsheviks. Page 111. Violet nodded. She had heard that. How is your little friend in the Jim Crow car? Miss Kelly asked. Violet looked at her, surprised. She's all right, she said. The seats aren't so nice there, but she's fine. Violet didn't think it was fine at all, actually, but Miss Dexter had seemed to, and she was an adult. It's a national shame, said Miss Kelly. This Jim Crow business. My organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, is fighting to put an end to it. There's no reason decent people can't ride in a train car with each other. Violet stared at Miss Kelly. But you're not colored, she said. Then she covered her mouth, shocked at her own rudeness. No, I'm not. But that doesn't mean I can't fight for justice, side by side with colored people. Miss Kelly patted Violet on the shoulder. You know it's wrong, putting your friend in another train car. When you know right from wrong, don't let anyone tell you differently. They both looked over at Miss Dexter. I won't, Miss Kelly, said Violet, and meant it. Soon it was time to fold down and rearrange the seats into berths. The porter came in to help them with this. Turn the page. Page 112. Violet climbed into a top berth beside Miss Dexter. She lay awake for a long time, boxed in by the train's curving metal ceiling, the wall, the thin, lumpy mattress, and Miss Dexter. She thought about Myrtle in the Jim Crow car, probably sitting up all night in a bat rattan seat. Finally, Violet drifted off to sleep and dreamt that she was running and running, trying to catch a train that left a long time ago. Sometimes the train stopped at stations, and Violet woke, sliding forward as her head bumped against the partition. Then she fell back asleep until the train started again, and her feet hit the partition at the other end. The train whistle let out a long, loud moan each time the train came to a crossing. Finally, Violet gave up sleeping and lay awake, wondering what Mr. Martin had done to get people called Palmer agents after him, and whether he had survived his leap into the dark. End of Chapter 9 Homework. Read Chapter 9, then complete the summary notes and summary. Let's review how to fill out the Somebody In Wanted But So Then summary notes. The somebody is the character or the narrator in a text. In is the place where the text is set. Wanted is what the character or the narrator is hoping for. But is the problem or the obstacle that might get in the way of what the narrator or the character wants. So is the outcome or resolution and then is what happens to move the story forward. The somebody is Violet. For the in, you're going to record the setting of this chapter where the story was taking place. For the wanted, you're going to write down what it is that Violet wanted to do. In this case, she wanted to bring Myrtle some food because Myrtle was stuck in the Jim Crow car. But after she brings Myrtle the food and she gets back to the suffragist train car, there were blank who were looking for blank saying he was a traitor. Fill in those blanks. So very quickly, Violet decides to go find Blank and warn him about Blank. Fill that in in that box. The 
Then Mr. Martin decides to blank, and Violet returns to the suffragist's car, where the agents warn them that they could get in trouble for helping him. Pause the video if you need more time to complete the work on your homework. Now it's time to write your summary using your summary notes. Start off your summary by saying, in chapter 9 of the Hope Chest, and then you're going to fill in the blanks. I've given you the structure here. You can use your summary notes to help you fill in the blank. Remember in the blank it might be more than one word. It could be a phrase or a sentence that fits in that blank. In Chapter 9 of the Hope Chest, Violet is blank, but Myrtle had to travel in the Jim Crow car. Violet wanted to blank. When she returned to the suffragist car, there were blank looking for blank. She went to find blank and warn him about blank. Mr. Martin decides to blank, and the agents were very angry, warning Violet and the other suffragists that they could blank. Take your time to rewrite this summary and fill in the blanks with the correct information from your summary notes. End of chapter 9